My name's Matt Bailey. I'm the National Ambassador for the Scotch Malt Whiskey, so Scotch Malt Whiskey Society, uh, Australian chapter, and I'm here to talk to you tonight about colour. So uh, allow me to work this out for a second. So I've got all my details here. Okay. Um, okay, 45 Fim, Dram, Denise, Whiskey Soros, Caribbean Whiskey Drinker, Malia Barry, everyone's tuning in. Thank you so much. Dram and Bread joined. Dram and Bread, what a, what a name. I want to talk to you tonight about colour, colour in whiskey. Now, I'm going to show you, I'm going to start with a bit of an experiment. I'm going to show you what colour looks like in whiskey, or more aptly what it looks like in water first. But I'm, that's where I'm going to start. Let's talk about colour. Now, in whiskey, uh, in finished distilled spirit that's already been matured in oak, and then bottled, most distilleries add colouring. The colouring is uh, loosely described as distiller's caramel, uh, or the technical title for it is E150, and then there's five shades of E150. E150 A, B, C, D, E. E being the darkest, A being the lightest, and they these distilleries use colouring to um, affect the overall appearance of the spirit. Now I've talked a little bit about colouring before, but I'm going to do a bit more, be a little bit more interactive with the entire session tonight, and so you can actually join in and have a look at what colour does to what colouring does to a water, does to a spirit, and does to other product. I'm getting to that. I'm getting there. Um, <laughs> if you have a rant today, Scott already beat you to his topic was inflation. How has he already beat me? He's always after me. He goes a nine p.m. live, not an eight p.m. So I don't know where Scotty is. If Scotty's already been live tonight, I must have missed it because I normally get in later on a Monday. Okay, I'm going to pour water into this glass. Now, let's say that's a reasonably sized dram you've got there. It's got 30 mils, 35 mils maybe in that glass. That is, of course, just normal water. So we're going to start with a glass of water. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a bit of E150 to it. This is a bit of a rant because I'm talking about distilleries that add uh, add caramel coloring why they do it the society doesn't do it at all i'm going to talk about a bit about that as well but i'm going to blaspheme properly here take a look at this water and take a look at this uh i'm going to preface by saying you've got to be really careful when doing this this stuff is super potent this distiller's caramel the z150 um it looks like a little bottle of like ipecac or something but it's not it is distiller's caramel and um Basically, it's really, really potent. So I've got a green society uh, uh, layout here, as you've probably seen from every video, uh, and I'm really hoping that it doesn't um, stain. Um, he's live now. No, no, no. Don't worry about Scotty. Join my channel. Join the society channel. I'm far more entertaining than Scotty. You can take that to the bank. No, I'm kidding. Scotty and I get along with your house on fire. Look at this. So I'm taking this glass of water here, and I'm going to add a drop of just, a, just seriously, just a tiniest, tiniest, tiniest bit. Now you saw how much I added just then. Absolutely nothing. There you go. You can get an idea of the color just on my finger there. It's it's pretty potent stuff. Um, I'm wearing my grubby pants. It doesn't matter. Here we go. Look at that. I've literally added just a drop, and that could be mistaken for a nice ruby, ambery, lovely dark spirit. That for me is a first fill sherry, or even maybe a second fill. Maybe second fill natural color. Uh, that could be a second fill 20 year old whiskey right now in that glass. What does it smell like? E150 diluted into water. It smells like not much. But there's the slightest hint of golden syrup. The slightest hint of molasses and golden syrup. It is distilled, it is uh, distilled as caramel after all. It does have a, uh, a burnt caramel uh, molasses. If you've ever opened a fresh jar of golden syrup, a fresh jar of molasses especially, it's got that immediately. So I'm going to taste it. Tastes like water with the slightest hint of golden syrup. Not much to that. Uh, I need to tip that out, but before I do, I want to show you an experiment here. Here I have a whiskey that was quite popular from Outturn that is sold out, I'm afraid. By the way, happy post Outturn Monday to you all. Outturn was on Friday. It was an absolute ripper. We all had a lot of fun. Um, and I. it was really great. So many members getting engaged with that time, which is great. But tonight I'm talking about that potent little bottle that is sitting here of E150. So what that's done to that spirit there 
is quite incredible. Or to the water, I should say. So I'm going to hold those up so you can see them now. You could be very much mistaken for thinking that is a lovely 20-year-old refill sherry or even first fill sherry. I've got some... Look, I'm going to do... I'll do you a comparison. This is why I've got this on the table here. Have a look at the colour difference between those two. I'm not sure you can really see it with me as the background. They're not too far apart. They're almost identically the same colour. I remember one's a thicker glass than the other and different light, dif light differences between the two on camera. Uh, what does it taste like? Let me answer that question, 45 Finn. Ugh. Tastes like grubby water. It does. It tastes like me metallic... Uh, metallic water. Really badly, badly refined water. Which is what it is. It's water with just the tiniest, tiniest, tiniest stash of E150 added to it. What I have in my other hand is natural colour. Refill bourbon hogshead of a society cask, 55.57. Digging up ginger, a popular whiskey from last Friday. Now that finally smells like whiskey. <laughs> Andrew and I actually tasted this um, on the on our Facebook live stream when we did a, a live stream together, probably one of the last social gatherings I'll have for a while. Uh, and it was, um, it was delicious. It's um, We both absolutely raved about it for good reason. It was a lovely cask. It was a lovely maturation. It had that sort of fruity floral aroma that, that the distillate at Distillery 55 has. And that lovely re team refill, hashtag team refill, going on in, as well in the spirit. I've said it before and I'll say it again. It's the perfect whiskey for me and for many others I appreciate. Uh, is where the, uh, the distillate, the distillate character, the spirit character of that distillery meets right in the middle with the cask character. And so it's, you don't get these whiskies that are overly new makey, overly fainty, overly distillery character. And I've tasted quite a few of those and you get whiskies that are way too much cask character where they taste like uh, the cask has soaked the spirit beyond recognition. All of that finding that middle point and that's what the panel look for. So it's worth noting on. Let me grab some of those comments coming through. Um, Whiskey and Wisdom join. Andrew, good to see you. I was just talking about you. Crazy, like iodine. Yes. Um, Ali's Whiskey is good to see you. What does it taste like? Oh, yeah, we go. I said it was pretty blip. Um, you're pouring from a bottle I can't buy. How cruel. Must man, it was available on Friday all the way up until this morning. They only just sold out this morning. I'm very sorry. <laughs> um, you're gonna, you're gonna, uh, you're really going to weak ding up ginger. You're about to sin. This boy needs whiskey. Jesus. Anyone tasted Big Swell? Can they confirm it's not just E150 in water? I can confirm Big Swell is not E150 in water. It's a lovely blended sherry malt, that one. But it's a really cool com color comparison that I've only just accidentally gotten right just then. Uh, which is the whole purpose. And I added literally just a drop of to that one. So I'm going to show you what happens now. Here's some real blasphemy. I know this whiskey. I know digging up ginger by now. It's been on my desk for a couple of weeks. Okay. Not that glass, the bottle I mean. Uh... The, the society gods will have to forgive me for this one, but I'm going to add a drip, drop of E150 artificial colouring, and you'll see how much I add to this. And remember, if I spill this stuff, my desk is ruined. So the things I do for you guys... Ooh. Literally just a drop. Now, look at the colour on that. That is a worryingly first fill sherry cask now. And I added, again, just a drop. So that's what it does, about the same drop to water to matured spirit. So now you know how little distilleries have to use to get that colour to the desired, more attractive colour. Now, I was going to make a statement before about how most whiskey distilleries add colouring to their spirit. That is not... I don't think that is true. I think the right way to say that line is uh, it's the distilleries with the most volume that are the biggest offenders, which is why most whiskey on market is artificially coloured. Some of your favorite brands, some of your favorite distilleries, they all do it. Now, does it affect the taste? I'm not going to do an AB on this one. I could do an AB. I could tip that out. It does. It actually sweetens it ever so slightly. It gives it that sweet caramel edge, but it is not natural like burnt plastic all that lovely savory that savory hogshead note that was there before 
has been pushed aside and is still there, but is pushed aside in place for a sweet, toasty note that feels forced, it feels fake. So why do they add coloring? Does anyone want to answer that for me? Or This is the first time a society has used E150. It is. This is the first time you've ever seen E150. Now, I'm going to tip... Um, now, I'm going to show you. Here's, here's another thing. Here we go. I'm going to tip the water one out. Um, I don't really have a spittoon handy because I said it wasn't that organized. Um, so I have to go into the head. And I'm just going to pour something else uh, off camera a little bit. So you can actually have a better understanding of what where E150 is otherwise used in, in other capacities. So th those capacities might change uh, and who and when they're used. This is quite exciting. Here we go. Here you have digging up ginger with a drop of E150 and here you get next level down again. Look at that. Now, does anyone want to take a guess what this is? Not much of a nose on it. Pretty fizzy palette. I'm messing with you, of course. I poured some Pepsi Max into that glass because even soft drink manufacturers use coloring to control the artificial color of their product. Pepsi Max, when it probably comes off the production line, I'm just assuming here, probably isn't pitch black. It's probably maybe a, a light brown, maybe a... Uh, I know a lot of natural colas, natural uh, carbonated cola drinks are quite a light brown. So I'm guessing that it's not naturally that dark, so that they color it, they have coloring in it. Even says it on the label. So, uh, more color, okay, let's grab some of these comments. Consistency is the actual answer. Consistency is the answer, Calta, you got that right. It's consistency, but the second answer is marketing. So by having whiskey that is an artificial color, it makes it look darker, bolder, older, richer, more desirable. Now for, for distillers to claim, if a distiller ever says, ever says to you that uh, E150, artificial caramel colorant, and I better not wave my arms around too much with the cap off this thing, uh, doesn't change the flavor of whiskey, I'd say you call them out. I mean, it does. It does actually change the flavor. There's been a number of experiments to this. I'm even doing one here right now, a very informal experiment, um, to show that it does change the overall flavor and makeup of that, of that product. It changes it. Now, you only need a drop or two if you maybe... Probably, I'm gonna go with a rough estimate, I can never actually find the exact answer for this, but for a 200 litre barrel of whiskey, probably only need about 50 mils of caramel colorant. There's 60 in that bottle. So you only need you know, maybe a full bottle of that per 200 liters to start getting to that color point on an already mature whiskey to bring it down to the color. You saw the color difference between the water version of a drop and the uh, spirit version of a drop, it was radical. You don't need a whole lot to actually get to that point. Um, so marketing is correct, consistency is correct, more color brings in the dollars, our hands is correct. And you, we, we, we get washed into this realm of where color is king and, and uh, the darker it is, the more desirable it is. And you know the real shame is? The real shame, and I'm not naming any names, I'm not blaspheming any distilleries at all. But I've seen some distilleries, especially, uh, obviously core range releases, not society ones, we don't use any color at the society. I've seen some core range releases where the even things like their 30, 40, and 50 year old versions of their product have artificial coloring. You're talking about a whiskey that has had 40 years or so in an oak cask. And yes, that cask may have been a third, fourth, fifth refill cask. So there's not a whole lot of color to give even in the first 10 years, which is where it's gonna pick it up, or it's more aptly the more seven or eight years than normally. Uh, so even after, it's not gonna change color after too much longer. So why not leave it at that beautiful natural straw or hay or amber color that it comes out at rather than adding this color to sell this premium packaging. And I have no problem with marketing. Of course, I, that's where I work and I understand that the, there is a need for that to create that. But I think as time goes on, I think distillers are gonna be using it less and less because as the whiskey community as a whole becomes more educated, we wouldn't even be having a discussion about E150 10 years ago. Very not like well, not likely 10 years, well, maybe 10 years ago, maybe not 15 years ago. The scene has changed so much that the whiskey education level has increased to the point where the we can talk about these things now. They're exciting to talk about, and they have uh, they have a certain history with it now, of course, but using that coloring to create a consistent color profile is something that you see a lot of. Now, I'm gonna preface by saying you see a lot of it in Scotland. 
It, it's not too uh, it's not too common uh, across other parts of whiskey making around the world. You see a little bit. I, I know it does happen in, at some places in Japan, and they're not very reputable distilleries to begin with. Um, I know of two distilleries in Australia that have experimented with it, uh, but I don't know if either one of them are continuing to do so. That's another. I don't know enough about those ones. Um, but you, it doesn't exist in bourbon. It doesn't exist in American uh, bourbons and ryes really at all. Um, in fact, I think it's I think it's I think it's against against regulation in the United States to use any additives of any kind, uh, and it's it's the one you can get away with. The Scotch Whiskey Association do let you get away with it, and it does create consistency, which grows the category. So I completely understand why it's there, but I just wish it wouldn't be. Let me grab some more comments. Cola, yeah, that was correct. Is it because people? Uh, is it because some people use uh, think the color is a sign of whiskey better? Forty five fin, yes. If you see a whiskey that is darker in the bottle you naturally gravitate sometimes towards it. I mean, if you're a more seasoned whiskey drinker, you don't really care about the color. You're not really paying attention to the color. You're paying attention to the flavor. And you're paying attention to the distillery and the tasting note and everything like that. If you're, if you're only gravitating towards color, it's often newcomers into the whiskey industry. It's often sort of those who are gravitating towards it first rather than those who, are, who have had a bit of experience with knowing which ones to dodge because of how much color they use. Coke was correct, that was right, yes. Uh, you probably heard the psh in the background. I, I meant to unscrew that before I started. Um, I once read a whiskey writer who called the E one fifty the Technicolor in whiskey makes it artificial. Yeah, that's a good that's a good one. I like to think of E one fifty as just uh, as yeah as the as the the lipstick of the of the whiskey world. It, you can you can tart up a whiskey with a bit of color, but it, it's not going to hide what's actually underneath it. You can still well, it, you know, it will actually actually will hide what's underneath it. That's that's the whole point. It will hide what's what's actually going on behind the lipstick rather than all this makeup and making it look pretty. But I just think it might be something a case of uh, making it a bit more sort of, a bit more natural whiskey is a bit more desirable sometimes. That's a terrible example, but you know what I mean. That's a bad order to get. <laughs> uh, so did I, hashtag deputy. Uh, Jane Avery Whiskey, good to see you, Jane. I know some have asked this, but last time, uh, by law though, they need to state that E150 has been used at any point on a whiskey. Very good point, Cal. Okay, let me get to that question. By law in Australia, in Australia, on bottles of whiskey in Australia, you don't have to state whether E150 has been used. It's not a requirement. Labeling requirement for additives and, and whatnot in the whiskey is a lo is local law based. So whether it has to be stated on law is is by country by country sort of approach. So what it means is if a Scotch whiskey like um, let me use Highland Park as an example, uh, as a, throw it out there as a random example. If, if Highland Park use uh, E150, in Australia, you won't know that. If you live in Germany, however, you'll see Mit Farbstoff, Mit Farbstoff, Farbstoff, which means with colour, has colour, added colour. So that is, uh, that is an example where some markets like Germany require different food and food safety labelling laws. So yes, in some markets, you have to, that has to be uh, stated, but in most markets, it's not. In fact, most markets, it's, it's like Germany... Sweden, I think, is almost about it for, for those kind of labeling laws. Um, Jay Davis, good to see you, mate. Uh, yeah, if you see uh, Farber Mint Caramel, sorry, yes, uh, uh, Farber Mint Car Caramel, yes, it, it contains caramel, it contains caramel coloring. Sorry to bourbonize your stream again, but I would say bourbon is the category where color would be most important. Color is important in bourbon, but it picks up so much color from virgin oak, Joel. So bourbon doesn't really need any coloring added. I actually have just a bog standard bottle here for a later stream uh, for messing around with a wild turkey, uh, the 101. As you can see there, it's got, it's quite amberish already. Adding colour to that would be completely unnecessary. Uh, virgin oak imp imparts so much rich initial colour from the oak that, you know, it's, they're not using refill casks, so they don't need to colourise it. It's virgin oak casks, no need for colour. Bourbonise it. Yeah, there you go. Paulie Edward joined, good to see you. Hartwood Taz joined, PHB23 joined, good to see you. Isodramming, yes, we're all isodramming. That's, uh, that's catching on, I think, Tim. Ha uh, ha, Apple didn't uh, like the word bourbonized. I think that means I, I can claim it. <laughs> that's your word now, Joel. Um, isodramming, yes, we're all isodramming. But the whole point of tonight was to talk about color. Now, I've got here some, oh yeah, that's Pepsi Max. And I've got here a 55.57. How attractive does that whiskey look suddenly? When in fact, it's 50, 60, 70 shades lighter than what it actually is in that glass. 
Now all I can smell is the caramel. I probably added too much. But I've shown you now what water, what spirit, and what cola in that in that capacity has done has transformed into with the by you know having that bit of caramel just to just to ruin it. So this stuff is is quite fun to use at tastings in person and online of showing how much you know coloring you need to add to a whiskey, which is nearly nothing at all, just a drop, just a tiny pinch to in infect the whole spirit with it. Now, yeah, it's like I say, it's for consistency's sake. I get it. I just, I'm hoping that in the future, we're moving towards a point where a bit like the society, we can have whiskey that isn't always just artificially colored. Looks like Cavill and Sol's cherry cut. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's another story entirely. That's not so much coloring, but that is uh, what we call Paxaret. That is um, very, very soaky casks. Uh, and the casks that, and the cask treatment and STR and everything like that that they use at Cavalan. That's a whole nother stream. But they, yes, the reason why those sherry casks always look so dark is they're using Paxaret. They're using a, a technique and a... Uh, also, it, this dates back to the Dr. Jim Swan's influence on, on Cavalan and their, and, and um, uh, Dr. Ian Chang's influence on what he wanted the spirit to be. And a lot of those casks they collect are already assembled and already have a fair bit swishing around, I'm guessing. So there's there's a whole lot there's a whole lot to more to discuss, which is why I mean even the society uh, ones that we bottled one thirty nines they and we're getting some more as well, uh, were were so desirable uh, and they they were very dark, and yes they carried a lot of color and they were very um very popular. So even when you bottle into green glass, or brown glass, uh, people still go a bit crazy over color. And what even baffles me even further, I'll be honest. <laughs> There's a few distilleries out there that bottle into green glass and still artificially color their whiskey. Why artificially color it if you can't see the color in the green glass? Anyway, you can see the color, however, in our Heresy bottlings, uh, which is nice. They're a nice sort of change of form. Still the same bottle shape, which I like. I love the Society bottle shape. I know I'm biased, but it feels like it's got a sense of heft and a sense of occasion to it with the, you know, the, the shape of it. It's got, a, it's got a lovely shape, which is recognizable in a monogram, of course, and it's part of our visual identity these days. Uh, that's a good point. Why, why does Kevin get that color in those casks versus Scotland? Cowplay, that's a, that's a uh, question for another episode, but they do get quite a lot of color and it's, I'll delve more deeply into how they, their processes and uh, Paxaret and, uh, and their cast treatments and STR and all that kind of stuff, which is, which is a whole nother, that's a whole hour within itself. Uh, Joel, yes, yes they are. I can almost certainly uh, uh, think that they almost certainly think they are. It's it's desirable to do so. It's desirable to have that color in that whiskey for Cavalan in their case, because it looks you know that's what sells it is that color. We we all know we've seen some of their sort of like maybe port or uh, uh, maybe maybe even some of their sherry casks that are maybe a bit more sort of that kind of color, and you go. Uh, this might not be as good as the one that's coming out that's next to it that has that kind of color instead. So there's definitely there's definitely a play there in terms of how it's marketed and how it's created uh, to as a as a premium product, and that is still in quite especially in the markets they are quite big in are quite developing markets in terms of appreciation and understanding of good whiskey. So if it's in a developing market. Their, you know, their, the obsession with age statements, not so much in Cavalan's case, but in like the obsession with the, the, those markets' obsessions with uh, higher age statements is still there. Those markets' obsessions with dark color are still there. I think it's still there to an extent in Australia, but I think we're doing a lot better because I think largely driven by uh, local spirit as well in some cases because almost no Australian whiskey carries an age statement. It's a very few. There's a couple of distilleries that do. Uh, Helly's Road springs to mind immediately. Um, Sutherland's Cove to an extent, but not really an age statement in some cases, but more of a distilled date and end date. Um, bottling date, sorry. End date. Mm. Um, but yeah, uh, yeah. And I think having, it's quite a young market in Australia and I think people uh, can appreciate good quality when they see it. I mean, look at, I mean, Archie Rose Rye, big shout out to them for winning the world's best rye. They're an amazing partner bar of ours and we're working with them quite a bit. Um, and, you know, their, um, you know, their rye is, uh, is, two to three years old. It's it's young spirit. Uh, it's all over two years old by uh, Australian law, but 
it's most of it's under three years old. So there's a little bit over three years old that's sitting in their warehouse, but really not much. Where did I get in from there? Um, Muzz says, uh, yeah, exactly. Your solace share is almost black. Yeah. See there, Whiskey Soros, that, that might be more a case of how much, you know, uh, Paxarote was in that cask and how, and the treatment of that cask. But yeah, I hope you're enjoying it. Um, we enjoy, enjoy, good to see you, mate. Muzz says, it, it is good to try cheap blends and whiskies to know what caramel taint is like. Uh, this sounds hugely elitist. And I tried to find one for this video, but I don't have any uh, cheap blends in my office at the moment. I have often, there's often something like a bottle of Dewar's or uh, something like that sitting on the shelf and it might be remnants from something, but um, no, I don't have any at the moment. But I know exactly what you mean, Murray. It's finding those, um, finding cheap blends to actually know what that caramel tastes like. And some blends are far more offensive than others when it comes to how much caramel taint you can get in it. Um, and if you want, if you want to try, if you want to compare it next to a blended malt that doesn't have any colouring, that might be a cool, cool comparison within itself. Plenty of big swirl left, by the way. Just my little plug for tonight. We're all about learning tonight. This is not a, this is no, there's no sales pitches in any of these videos, but uh, not a sales pitch, of course. But I'm just saying, there's plenty of big swirl left. Uh, it did really well at Outturn. I think last time I checked, there was 50 something bottles, but there might be a far less now because I checked a couple of days ago. Uh, and it's it's a really good uh, everyday drink here at 120 bucks. So if you want to grab any of those. Um, that might be the way to go. Um, uh, B for you to uh, go. I have 10 to 1 going this week. Bet you have that pencil or pen on your desk. I have a pencil on my desk. And I have a Kilhoman pencil on my desk. Sorry, Scotty. How much does toasting and charring of cast affect the colour? Jay Davis, very good question. Uh, it does to a fair extent, I think. Um, uh, generally speaking, the heavier, to the heavier toast uh, affects the... Uh, the overall end color, but again, it's every cask is quite unique in that regard. I find that yes, heavily charred and heavily heavily toasted casks can impart more color, but it's not sort of a rule of thumb. So it's like they can, they can't, they do sometimes, they don't sometimes. Um, it's more, but it's far more affecting of the flavor and the taste. You can always almost spot a heavily charred cask or a heavily toasted cask. They are very different. They've also got a, a different profile on each, but it's not always the color. Hope that answers your question. Um, uh, 20 or your Sullivan. Yeah, Joel. Yeah, and that also won a big award as well. I think um, Best Australian Single Malt, which is very cool for them. Big ups to Sullivan's on that one again. They, they win all the awards. Um, it's not a it's not a great cast, to be honest. Had better. Yeah, it's often, the, it's often the case, isn't it, Whiskey Soros? The super dark ones uh, are often almost... Uh, I find the same with a lot of even natural, uh, naturally coloured whiskies that are, are of that colour. There's very, very, very few whiskies of that color ilk, uh, of that super, super dark sort of like almost like Pepsi in a glass kind of look like that, uh, where I've tasted it and gone, oh, you know what? That's one of the most incredible whiskies I've ever had. Most of the time they've come across as uh, either over oaked uh, or just you know, a little bit too long in the cask kind of problem. Um, it's always for me, yes, tasting some whiskies that look like that have come across really nicely, but some like that, end up coming across as yeah overly like just tannic and or tannic or just over oaked over egged uh so it came late we're doing e150 shots we are yeah cheap dimples does that does that have a strong e150 i, I know dimple has e150 i don't know how much sorry um the only reason the swar coloring is the same reason they not allow maturation into tequila casks they have to have their Tush, a lobby to hard. Well, I mean, that's changed, hasn't it? There's a whole bunch of cast re-regulation -re of cabin, like ex tequila and stuff like that. That only happened last year, though, Steve. Uh, it's a it's an interesting point. Uh, I'm not anti... Like I said, I'm not, I'm, I want to make it really clear. I'm not anti E150. Uh, I don't... But I just don't think it has a place uh, in the future of Scotch whiskey, and I think that I'm... And, I'm, and I think it should... Uh, the, we should embrace uh, and have better labelling for when we know it's there. In, especially in Australia, we should be able to see, oh, okay, this one can, can, this whiskey brand contains coloring, this one doesn't. I think we, uh, we, uh, we deserve to have that kind of better level of knowledge, even if it's just a tiny thing like they do in Germany, uh, you know, uh, mixed off von, von Caramel, sorry, whatever the wording is, I don't speak German. Um, and that, just having that on the back would be, you know, just has to be a small print, it doesn't have to be a selling statement. Uh... Are they an award you can buy? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, 
Joel says, is your office at your house or do you work till eight every night, man? Um, Joel, okay, completely reasonable question. My office is attached as a separate sort of part of my house. So it's sort of like a, it's down the end of the house. It's its own entity. It's got its own bathroom, all that kind of stuff. It's its own, its own balcony. It's, it's attached to the house, but it's on the far side. But this is where I work most of the time, even non-social isolating times. This is my main office. Um, uh, no, Rob, I just, uh, just added in 150 to dig up ginger. Yeah, it's properly, uh, properly, uh, <laughs> what do you call it? Yeah, very much properly blasphemous. I've, I've properly blasphemed. I have added E150 to dig up ginger, and the result is not something that I am enjoying drinking at all. It's still whiskey. I can still smell it. Ah, but I can smell the, uh, I can smell the caramel underneath it. No, 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 not underneath it. On top. It's like there's a really nice whiskey in there somewhere. And there's this disgusting cheap caramel glaze on top of it. And you can't scrape it off. It's a cake with icing you don't like. So it's a really nice sponge cake in the middle. But on top is this gross caramel. And that's why I've deliberately uh, ruined a dram with this bottling for your entertainment. So you can work out what E150 does to a whiskey. And why if you ever hear an ambassador say it doesn't affect the flavor. I think that's cause for alarm. You know, even Andrew, Andrew made a comment on his one of his more recent posts on Whiskey and Wisdom, well worth checking out, about, um, I kind of, uh, I'm not going to try and reference it because I'm going to get it wrong, but he said that there was an ambassador up the front who said something that was outrageously incorrect, or uh, it was either the ambassador lied about it or didn't know what he was talking about, so that he, he and some other, uh, one of his friends, uh, straight up walked out. I have no problem with that. That's exactly what should happen if you hear nonsense. And I like being brought up on my nonsense as well, by the way, as an ambassador. And sometimes I must, I'm going to get things wrong. We all do. Um, so I, but I, I'm always on a journey to learn more, as we all are. And I hope I, you can uh, take away as much as you can from everything I'm able to impart and um, let you know all about. The good news is there's a huge week of um, uh, live streams this week. Tomorrow night is 7 p.m. It's a bit earlier, and it's on our Facebook group. So in the group chat is going to be, um, not chat, the group video is with a very special guest, uh, someone who is becoming, not becoming, is, and even becoming more so, one of the superstars of the whiskey industry in Australia. And I'm really excited to get this person on the live chat talking to members. It also helps that they're a member themselves and have been for a long time. So it's going to be really exciting tomorrow night. No more clues as to who that is. Wednesday night, you're going to see some of the most chaotic cocktail, you know, dram at home cocktail making crash test going on on this desk, which is going to be a lot of fun. Might have to reformat the camera a bit, maybe a bit further back. Maybe it'll be, it'll be on Instagram, but maybe you'll have to, we'll do it on Facebook as well or something. Because that's going to be a bit of a, a bit of fun <laughs> exercise in, uh, in uh, impatience and futility of someone who does not make cocktails for, for on the regular or for a living. And the, uh, and then of course, Thursday night, another special guest. Uh, this person on Thursday night has again been involved in the whiskey industry for a very long time. And they are also um, very keen, and they even said they'd uh, comb their hair for the occasion, which is really exciting. And then on um, Friday night is our Drams at Home Q&A, good Friday night drinks, and then the weekend will be a bit more informal following. Let me grab the, uh, however, the, um, the bad news is, well, bad news, the 20th of April tasting kit has sold out, I'm afraid. So, um... That's on the 20th of April, so it's about two weeks from now. Uh, all the kits have been sent out. We're sending them out. Any orders that finished today, we're going out today. Um, they are the tasting kit, five whiskeys, five tasting notes, all everything, a bit, a bit of fun. And it's going to be broadcast out of my office, and we're going to do a live tasting with this kit all together, which is going to be so much fun. We're going to broadcast it to as many platforms as possible. Um, technology and gear permitting. Uh, and then... Uh, but the good news is we've got some of the, I'm going to, I've, I've hinted on this before. The other good news is to finish on is that we've got the festival packs coming soon. Festival packs, pardon me. We're making the festival packs locally in market for you to have a, to, so you can experience the Speyside, Campbelltown and Facial festivals in one. This is super exciting. I'm really excited to be able to work on that and create these festival packs. So you can actually have the taste of the festivals that are not happening this year but still have these single casks in your home as a sample, or you can go in the ballot to win some, uh, win, to, to, you can go to the ballot to uh, purchase some of those casks, of course, when they land. 
Um, but also we'll have, um, we'll have some others which are non-ballot also available. So we've got a few things coming up, of course. May out turn we're working on already, but of course before May out turn is the April tasting of the pack and of course the April mid month, which is very exciting. And I'm gonna talk about that perhaps later this week because that's gonna be coming up. That's gonna creep up on us. Uh, okay. Will there be another round table on Wednesday? Yeah, we could do a round table on Wednesday. I th actually, round table is this Wednesday. I think it starts a little bit late. Um, but I'll, yes, Oak Barrel Round Table is something I'm involved with, which is extremely exciting, where we get some special guests in and we have a four or five people talking and taking questions, which is good fun. So that might end up being the Wednesday one rather than the cocktail one. I need to work out the schedule with Scotty on that, but thank you for reminding me. Um, yes, yeah, some would say it's heresy. Yes, uh, um, some might say that. Yes. Look, it is, it is. Mid-month is a heresy release. Heresy. Heresy. So I've already been pulled up on that twice. I keep saying heresy. Why do I say that? Anyway, heresy uh, release is the mid-month. Um, uh, Facebook freebies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You better believe it. Um, we make up stuff all the time. I, I know you do, Tim. That's fine. Um, huge week. Does that mean huge giveaway? Is that what YouTubers do? Ah, come on. Uh, perhaps you need to talk about the other process of the devil. Chill filtering. David... That's a really good point. I might do another whole episode on that because I could really, it's just, it's, you can talk a lot about these things. I've talked about 40 minutes now for about coloring. So um, we could talk more about chill filtering in another episode, David. So really appreciate it. It's the other devil though. It is the other devil. Um, uh, here we go, here we go. Good, good, good. So is the festival thing on its own out turn? Yes, yeah, so festival things are coming in May, our, uh, Joel. Don't quote me on that because we're working on some very tight timelines with the bottling hall. Uh, with deliveries, of course, freight at the moment is being affected not just by from us, but from everyone. That means two things. That means some bottlings are taking a little bit longer to get here than we'd hoped. And second of all, deliveries from us to our members are being quite delayed at the moment. So if you order something from Outturn on Friday, please be patient. I'm seeing packages taking up to nine, 10 days for same city deliveries. We're sending them out, Australia Post are collecting them, but so many businesses that are moving to online so the number of parcel deliveries at the moment has increased exponentially at Australia Post and they just don't have the staff to handle it and of course many staff are probably working from home among other other things like that but for the hands-on staff they're still they're going full pelt at the moment so you will if you place an order you will get it however we are working with a very um overstressed postal system at the moment and don't mention private couriers because I don't want to put the pricing up um yeah, Rowan, Rowan says, might need a mid-month outturn. Everything is selling out. I've noticed everything is selling out. It's been a very big April outturn, which has been great. Uh, we'll have some new um, we'll have some new casks up mid-month. But as always, we place things on the website every so often for you to take notice of. Different things here and there. Um, <laughs> uh, it's not separate to my outturn, no. Um, but we'll have something special to offer. Don't worry. You'll, you'll see how we go. Um... Australia Post Evening Saturday Delivery. Yeah, they are. They're trying to keep up really at the moment. It's going a bit mental. Uh, and they don't do signature on delivery anymore like we normally do. So if you need to change your, if you need to update your delivery details, please do so on our website uh, because you might be working from home or wherever you are now. Ah, I mean, he's glad you corrected yourself, but I did. Okay, um, that's all from me tonight. Thank you so much. What an amazing uh, chat tonight, as always. Uh, always appreciate doing these lives. Always love having a chat with you or taking your questions. Tonight's been all about colour, whiskey, caramel, E150, all that kind of good fun. And I'm going to try and enjoy this kind of ruined 55.57, but, you know, them's the breaks. Thanks again. See you tomorrow.